a high level kind of intro to Agile, things that I didn't know until after I was a scrum master. And then Mark is going to be talking about the pretty awesome um, integrated testing that TechSmith does here. I was, when he told me what he did, I was very impressed. And it was, I've, nev I've never heard of it functioning like that that well before. So he'll have the details of how the work's done, and I'll have the high-level intro to Agile. Um, I started out in operations infrastructure, started doing disaster recovery, all this Michigan State, moved into traditional project management, and then only two, maybe two and a half, three years ago, had the opportunity to work as a scrum master. And so I focused on scrum processes, loved it, loved it. I thought it dovetailed beautifully for me with my waterfall. It gave me my, a finger on the pulse of the actual work. I was able to make early corrections to meet milestones. And I, yeah, I, I think they're super compatible, but we can talk about that offline if we want to talk about that. Um, so as a scrum master, totally into scrum, imagine my surprise when I decided to do a little research into the manifesto, and it's so simple. All right, it's, it's agile is simply a set of values and the principles that align with the agile manifesto, which is very brief, we'll get to that in a second. How the work is done, also very simple. Short phases of work, frequent reassessment and adaption, continuous integration, I love that. Um, dun, 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 dun. Where's my next slide? Did I turn it off? Oh, there we go. So that's all the Agile Manifesto is. Um, I come, as I said, from traditional project management, also operations. What do you mean no processes or documentation? What? So anyway, but they do agree with both halves. They just agree more with the half on the right and prioritize that over the process. 12 Agile principles, a little more, slightly more definition. These were developed at the same time as the manifesto. I really like these. They really, to me, encapsulate everything. The point is to satisfy the customer. The whole team is pulling together with the customer. Business people are involved. It's not the isolated IT world that I grew up in as a girl. You have a constant small progress being made continuously and self-organizing teams. So if it's not working for the team, it's not working and you change it. This was come up with by, on a ski weekend, apparently, in 2001 by a group of people that love processes and came from all of the top software development processes of the time. I don't like saying software development because in operations, my background in disaster recovery operations and infrastructure, it takes a village, right? It takes all of those things for successful development, so, but anyway, but they were all software developers. Um, and they brought their knowledge of all these different, Scrum is very old from like the 50s, I was surprised to hear that, but, but they brought their knowledge of all these processes and, uh, and tried to distill them down to the important bits. Um, they wanted to get out from under a burden of process, where the process is impeding your success and your and you're getting things done and into a process that works for the people in the work. Um, a model based on people collaboration and <laughs> the number one in an environment that they enjoy working in. So we all know if people are enjoying their work, are being leveraged properly, they're happier and more productive. Um, my favorite quote, this is right from the original manifesto, that it's the mushy stuff, it's the values and culture. If you go back to that, you can vet any of the choices you're making, and they'll be right. Um, one of my favorite guys, there's a bunch of good presentations of the GoTo conference, and this is one of the, David Thomas, one of the founding guys. So I stole this slide from his presentation, though I didn't send him a note about it. Um, and no rules are universal, and all rules need context. There's no blindly following 
process. Question the process continuously and change the process if it's not working. Um, what we're doing, it, it's a reiteration of the first slide, finding out where you are. That's testing. <laughs> Take a small step towards your goal, adjust your understanding based on what you've learned, and then do it again and again and again and again. Um, and this was new to me, but I loved it. I've used it in my home remodeling. Um, with, when all else is equal, make a change that's e or make the easier to change in the future choice. So I know we've all dealt well, at least I've dealt with many systems that are solidified and not good. But the idea that you're, you're making something that maybe a year, maybe five years, maybe 14 years, you'll be able to change. All right, and another reason that I love Agile is I'm a huge fan of TQS, Dimming Principles. That came into my operations life 20 plus years ago. It's fantastic. It is reiterative processes. It is integrated and it is Agile. Anti Fragile, I don't know anybody, if you guys are familiar with the Black Swan risk management work that I've done for DR. It's, it's, it is an anti-fragile development process that loves change. You know, it embraces change. That's what makes you anti-fragile. You like change. You feed off change. And the reiterative way Agile works, something changes, you just plug it into the next iteration, two weeks or whatever you're working on, and you're good. You don't fear it. It's no, oh no, now everything is ruined. Okay, so. Everybody throw a dart at their favorite. <laughs> so from, from the high level, all things, it's very easy, just the manifesto and the principles, some more detailed systems and prescribed systems have come down. Remember, they should all be flexible. But um, so I know everybody's favorite. I love Scrum, so that's, you know. All right, so testing. Since we're talking about where you are, and what you've done are the starting and ending of each of the iterations, that's testing. So testing is integrated. It's, to me, it's the, one of the cornerstones of Agile. It tells you where you are. So you're, you're stepping up fresh in the foundation of what you know works. You're building at a strong foundation. And let's see my, I love that quote because there's no disputing. I mean, how many times, have, I think that's what the customer wanted. Oh, it turned out that wasn't what they wanted, but you told me that was what they wanted. Uh, so if you're testing, if you're putting that test in front of the customer, they change their mind. It's a very different conversation when you say, the customer changed their mind, as opposed to the finger pointing and blaming when that wasn't what they wanted, you, you know, so. So, yes, of course, there's a testing manifesto. And all, all of the Agile testing high-level bits go right back to that manifesto of the 12 principles. There's no gotcha. It's a team atmosphere. Everyone's trying to do their best code. Everyone's working together. And there's a customer of testing as development. It's not a gotcha game. It's not a throw it over the wall. It's nobody's tricking anybody. We're all in this together. Um, are we ready to mark now? Oh, now we're down to mark. Mark is going to talk about, he is a testing specialist here at TechSmith, and he told me what he did, and I, it, it's, I think it's fabulous. It is really integrated, agile testing, and I can't wait for you guys. I know as I talk to some people, they're really interested in how it's being done, and they're really doing it here. So, Mark V. Alexander. Take that. I wanted to ask, I was curious, how many people work in what they would call an agile type process now? Okay. So I used to be <laughs> agilist, you know. Um, I've been in software testing about 19 years. Uh, majority of my time I spent doing automated tests. And uh, I've been here f for about a year on an Agile team. This is my first Agile team I've been on, but it's been a great experience. But I wanted to go back just a little bit to uh, you know where I came from. And in the beginning, there was automated regression tests. I worked at a company where every test of a release would be put in the automation test bed. 
So it would range from about 500 to 1,000 test cases. And uh, when it would start taking more than a week to run, we would work with testers and try to pare it down. And uh, then it would still take a day or two to review the output and try to weed through the false negatives. But uh, this is not what I would call fast feedback. Um, so why Agile? Um, so a lot of the problem, one of the things that I, after years of doing this, realized that you know a lot of the issues that people run into are not uh, defects that were put in the code. The problem is with the requirements or a misunderstanding of the requirements. So you know, t requirements in waterfalls like a telephone game. You know, the the business analyst takes some notes throws it over to the developers, they try to interpret it and translate it into code, throw it over the wall to the testers and they would try to verify it. And I've been in many situations where uh, at one company, once the requirements were signed off on, they wouldn't adjust them. They were signed off. And you had to fight tooth and nail to try to get anything changed instead of being a change request after the end of the release. And that's not teamwork. That's not getting things done and meeting the customer's needs. So what does this have to do with automation? <clears throat> so hopefully, you know, the notion of running an exhaustive test bed of regression tests at the end of the development cycle is a thing of the past. Um, on the teams I'm on, we try to use automation as much as possible to verify existing and new functionality during the development process, that is, before testing per se. Um, to do that, uh, we make small changes at a time and iterate on those to build up to the feature. Add test as you go at the lowest level possible in the system. We use a scrum based process to support our agile iterative development. Oh, I'm advancing here but not here. <laughs> so you guys are just looking at me. Small changes, iterate. Add tests as you go at the lowest level possible. Um, so we use iterative development and continuous integration. What is continuous integration? Simply, uh, a feature is divided into one or more thin slices that are then you know, put into production. So each change is something that's viable if you have to feature switch it off, you do, but you make small changes so that you can test and validate small changes. This eases regression testing and feature testing and allows you to build up and iterate and keep everything live in production. How do you do that? So on our team, we have, on our, right on our board, we have a definition of done. Um, for each feature, we satisfy these things. There's a lot of stuff on here, and then I'll get into some of that. But you'll notice that it just says automated tests. That's pretty vague. So what does that mean? Well, I want to go to like our whole process. So testing really starts at the beginning of the, f the user with the user story. The product owner, the tester, the developer, designers all sit down, discuss the feature. And most importantly to me, they discuss acceptance criteria. Acceptance criteria is what must be true to satisfy, the, to make this feature valid. Um, ideally, at this point, you would talk about even testing and how we would validate that acceptance criteria. Any testing, that, any discussion you can have about this before development starts helps people think how they're going to add the unit and integration tests right from the beginning. Um, so our, our delivery process starts with uh, the developer, you know, we do the acceptance criteria, the card gets pulled in, they do their work, they add their tests, and the first thing they have to do when they deploy it to a test environment is have green lights, that means their tests are passing. Then a developer does a peer code review 
And this is the point where another developer is going to look at how they implemented it and see if they liked it or not. And um, they would look at tests at this point, what tests have been added. So you can run your unit test on your local system. They have to deploy it to run the integration. And um, unless they put the full stack on the machine, some of them do that. Finally, they need QA thumbs. So this is where the, the software tester reviews the tests and the testing that's been done. So each, uh, when a PR comes to me, I'm expecting to see test notes from the developer. I'm expecting to see thumbs from a peer review. And I, I'll look at the test notes. And I should back up because ideally, even between doing acceptance criteria and uh, this point, I may have talked to the developer about what testing they were going to do and can some of those tests be automated and at what level. So at this point, is really at the end of the process. Hopefully, if there are some changes that go through and I say, wow, they've got really great test notes. I see that the test files have been updated to accommodate this change. I feel good about it. I may or may not even do any testing on that and let it go. Most often, I give it a quick look. but. Um, so, you know, when I'm reviewing a, a PR, which is the GitHub uh, pull request, I'm looking to see has, you know, has the test files been updated? Um, right off the bat, they'll tell me that either that change was so small that it didn't affect any tests, or, you know, really there's some discussion that needs to go on there. <clears throat> I think I just talked through this whole slide. So this is really kind of the wrap up of what I've said. I know there's not a lot of me on implementing automation. But to me, it's more of a whole story about how testing works with the developers and the product owner and everyone through the whole process to try to look for opportunities to automate tests up front and at the lowest level possible. Um, we do have. UI tests that we run and, and they're hard to maintain, but a lot of the functionality can be tested at the unit and integration level. So on our team, the testing, we discuss testing and how to verify the acceptance criteria before development. Unit and tests and integrations are added before and or during development. We don't do much test-driven development right now. That's something we might aspire to. We have dabbled with it, but for the most part, at some point, we're going to add tests. One, one thing I'll throw in here um, that we're working on is if you're adding the, your unit tests after you do development, most often you're just, in, whatever you developed is what you're testing. It may not be the right thing. So that's really where test-driven development might help because if you write tests based on the acceptance criteria, not your implementation, then it's going to tell you if you're, you're developing to the acceptance criteria. So when I review tests, and I do look, look at the code when I can, and try to see, is, is it verifying these things that we spelled out? So before a, a slice or PR is released, it's reviewed by uh, the, the tests have to pass. There's a peer review. Um, tests are added at each level. And behavior that can't be tested at the code level will be added to the UI test. Um, if it makes sense. Some, and there'll be, of course, review and exploratory testing that goes on. And that really wraps up what I had. So, yes? Um, when you said you get the notes back from testing, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, when you said you get the notes back, from, oh, I'm sure it should be. Green, Green means go. It's, it's on the recording. It's not on the speakers. Okay, sweet. Um, so when you're talking about getting the notes back, just one of the things I was curious about, do you guys use like like uh, Jira version 1, or do they actually bring you back like physical notes? Um, so we actually, I work right in GitHub, and okay. they have a pull request that they'll do. And that pull request, there may be multiple pull requests per feature, but each pull request will have its own description. I'll see the peer review in there, and then they put their test notes right in it. And then I'll go in and put my additional notes and my QA thumb right in the PR, huh. and then it gets shipped. So that serves as a form of documentation as well. Right, 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 right. Cool. It's on. Uh, it, it is on. 
Okay. Uh, you mentioned TDD as as a future uh, effort that you're going to get into. Are you doing anything looking at BDD as well? Um, yeah, they're they're related, right? Yeah. Spell out those documents. Uh, so test-driven test development and behavior-driven behavior. development. Um, e yeah, you know, my understanding of behavior-driven development is essentially you use a, a, a framework to encodify the acceptance criteria. And you d deploy those and they fail, like test-driven development. The tests fail and then you write the code to make them pass. And uh, yeah, that's kind of TDD and BDD are there. Some of our teams have experimented with BDD. I'm not as familiar with it myself. I have to be honest, I kind of don't like given when then, but you know, if it works, I'll do it. So um, yeah, it's on the map. What has your experience been with talking with developers, throwing out test ideas before they start coding? Um, so, you know, everyone's different. I work with some developers. They're really open to talking about things or even ask me uh, questions. But if I see a big change coming through or something that I know has had regressions in the past or is a problem area or I'm just really concerned about it, I'll just go right out and uh, talk to them and ask them, you know, what were you planning to test for that? And if it's, uh, especially if it's a back end change, something that I can't touch through the front end, I'll definitely sit down and, and talk to them about what testing they did. And a lot of times, just through the, just asking the question will make them think of things. You know how when you're trying to figure something out and you explain it to somebody, you suddenly remember it? It's the same way when you're asking somebody questions. You get them to talk about it, and next thing you know, they're like, oh yeah, I could add this test, that test. So. Um, I haven't had any negative experience. It's been pretty fruitful, yeah. Pam. How do you, is that just something you know when there might be a red flag on, on a change? Or is that, is there some kind of process to gauge the size or impact that you know it needs special reviewing? That's a reviewing? great question. Um, right now, I'm at the point of using experience or looking at, the size of the change but I am trying to work towards you know we had the METS presentation here before and I've talked with some uh, folks here where they keep a list of the functionality of the system and I think it would be a great way to flag parts um, that have had problems in the past uh, of course if you keep any metrics on where you know issues you're found um, but usually the team our team is pretty small and we're working on the same product all the time so they have a pretty good feel of where problem areas are and uh, that might be concern so anything else um, have you had any resistance from developers because uh, typically testers um, don't do anything in code and developers are very protective of their code base or code. Have you had any resistance from them trying to help with the, get the automation going? Um, well, now when you say get automation going, so far I haven't been able to get my hands on it. I want to do that and I have experience doing it. But I don't want to take away their ownership of their test code. Um, as long as you know they're involved in the process of developing it and understand that they're going to own it to maintain it and as a team you agree on what tests need to happen but for the most part I've not had any problem with that and most uh, developers are happy to get in and explain how the code's working or answer questions and like I said a lot of times I, I work with some guys that really uh, found that getting questions by QA helps them make a better product and once you get used to that feeling it's it's not a like like Pam says it's not a game of gotcha you know a lot of times the phrase that's used is good catch you know we caught that before it went out so yeah can we get a mic over here sure Uh. Yeah, uh, so how, like the tests are passed, are you talking about the 
The testing should start at the very beginning, just talking about testing and the, what needs to be true, the acceptance criteria. But the automated test, they add tests as they're adding the feature. So not only do the previous tests that have been added for any code that was there, any new code needs tests around it or needs tests updated. So there's definitely times where they'll be working on a piece of the application, up to date the test, deploy it to our dev environment, run the test and it fails and they find out that they broke this integration or that other thing and so there's something they missed and caught by the test. So, and then the developers themselves also do manual testing whenever it makes sense as much as possible because you know there's seven developers on the team and one QA and the idea is not that QA or software tester would do all the testing. They're, they're there as a specialist and as a, a backup. So um, developers do testing. What? Right. So does that answer your question? So for developers, they do manual testing or they have unit testing? All of that, all of the above. Do you do uh, pair testing with the devs um, for like maybe for the devs thumbs kind of thing? You know, do you, you know, maybe review code as well with them? Uh, um, I've done both of those, not as much as I should. I've come up quite a bit, and I'd like to do more of that. Um, recently, I so right now things have been pretty busy, and the most recent example I can give you is that we were starting to have some go back and forth, misunderstanding of the acceptance criteria. Even though we'd done all these things, it still wasn't clear. And what I thought was supposed to work, and I verified. So I went to the developer, I said, hey, you know, enough back and forth. Let's sit down, let's go through the process and make sure we're on the same page. And that was actually my first experience with TDD. So at that point, they said, oh, that's completely different than how I understood it. And he was pairing with our tech lead, and he said, hey, let's write some tests that encode what you just decided, and then we'll make sure that they pass when we're done. So. Is that? Um, you talked a lot about getting involved as early as you can in the process, which it sounds like helps a lot. How far in advance do, do you technically start your grooming, quote, quote, or acceptance criteria gathering from, you know, when you write them down and get them signed off front to when you actually start working on it? Because we found that, the at least I noticed, that the longer period of time takes place between when something is groomed and when you actually start working on it, the longer that time frame is, there's a lot of time for people to forget all the nuances of whatever issue they were working on, and then when we finally get around to it, it gets coded, and then that nuance kind of falls away to the side, or we'll discover something that we really should have covered in grooming, but because it's been such a long time, you know, people have kind of forgotten about it. That, that sounds like a great point, and I've experienced some of that. Um, ideally, we would meet and talk and have maybe a Three Amigos type meeting with um, developer, actually, and Three Amigos can be three to seven people or whatever. So, you know, we'll try to pull in. Designers are a big part of our, our development process. So, <laughs> um, and, but that hasn't happened a lot in my current project. It's a work in progress. But we do, no matter how much work has been done beforehand, before the sprint, we have a backlog grooming meeting where we go through the feature again, review the acceptance criteria, make sure our estimate, see if the estimate's changed or not, and hopefully we catch some of that stuff. So, um, you know, it's part of our, it's not just Scrum, we've actually started doing a SAFE here at TechSmith, and we've modified it, but, you know, it's helped us to get that process down. So before, you know, we planned out four weeks of work or whatever, well, four sprints, but before each sprint, we sit down and review what we have, make sure our estimates are right, and acceptance criteria makes sense. Because, you know, sometimes some other feature changed. In my uh, last sprint, we just found that we had uh, planned things in a different order, so we changed the order we were doing it from one sprint to the other to accommodate that change. We also find that designs a lot of the time just become out of date, like 
we'll go sure. through and work on a few stories and find all oh, of this this design you know concept just doesn't really work from what we've seen for whatever reason either we can't integrate it or it's just not doing what we thought it might and our designs are so far out in front of us that if we want to go back and change something it actually affects a lot of the design that's already been done because of how unsynced design except criteria gathering and actually doing the work because they're so spread out if we discover something while we're working on it and we have to iterate which is what Agile and Scrum are supposed to be about because we're so far behind the design and the AC gathering, like it's a huge disruption for them to go back and say, hey, we really can't do this or it's, it can't work this way for these reasons. And then that is a, like a huge wrench in the gears. You know, we have to stop and rethink all this work that's already been done because they've gone so far ahead of the actual implementation. I've experienced some of that. Well, I'm just curious to do the designers or UX or whatever, are they part of your backlog grooming? Yeah, they're they're part of our grooming sessions, but it's usually to review a design that's already a couple months old. Yeah. And it may not reflect current ACs, which has caused us a lot of problems because our design is actually part of our AC. So one of the ACs is it matches the design or it meets the design right, spec. Right. And if the design spec happens to be out of date, old, incorrect, and basically we're building in a bad acceptance criteria when we go to design something because our developers will go out and look at the design and say oh okay we need these fields and only these fields even and then they don't cross-reference the acceptance criteria and then we end up missing things you know it's like oh this is supposed to be a dynamic label or you know oh we're supposed to you know do something different here and because we didn't like you suggest come back before the sprint and review everything that we're about to work on you know we miss we run over those things and we miss them yeah, I can see that. I'd, I'd say uh, iterate, jump up and down and say we're iterating. Can you see that, Mike? Yeah, it is green. Yeah, no, <laughs> I got someone back here. Thanks, I, I, I heard a couple times now about uh, um, somebody worked on something and it's a couple of months and people forgot about it. It sounds like maybe um, you need to look at your whip, you know, your work in progress, because it sounds like your, your just-in-time uh, process is maybe a little long, and maybe if you tighten that up, some of those problems will go away. To that. We definitely have run, on, run into that situation where um, the acceptance criteria comes way in front, so it's almost like waterfall style requirements gathering. And so, even so, like one of the things we've tried to introduce is sort of a lean UX approach where we're bringing all that stuff in together, and there's these each iteration we're doing the UX and we're doing the, that, although we do no. UX testing and it's sad, but um, it's it's a dream. And um, but we try to bring that in. But we ran into that hardcore for a while where we had like requirements on our stories for the back up, but the backlog like six months before we get to them in the sprints, and they were just so jacked up by the time we finally got to them. So testing acceptance criteria was gone, the features are gone. So yeah, I've been through that a ton. And yeah, as someone said back there, like whatever you can do to tighten that up, and we did eventually, but it was you know, a lot of course correction along the way to try and iron that out. Um, the defense of having things planned out so far in advance that I hear almost every time is, oh, well, we need to be able to plan. You can plan without knowing what you're doing a year from now. Like you, the the program increment is two weeks for a reason because you want to have something deliverable at the end of two weeks. I understand that you know at a higher level, a higher business level, you want to be able to say by Q whatever of this year, we're going to have these things done for you, the customer. But that's kind of a hollow promise if you know everything is AC'd out six months in advance. And when you're three months in, you're starting to discover, oh, wow, these are not good requirements or we've missed something very important and now we kind of have to start over again. So How often does that happen? I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would argue that that is, um, that is the project manager's problem because I present a waterfall to get approval, but I'm also talking to leadership, and they know about the reality of milestone changes, of the changes. I, you know, 
offline, usually casually over drinks or coffee, <laughs> but the reality that they may encounter and the fact that I will be very quickly telling them with ample time to modify the plan, to notify the customer, to for them to handle that change on their end. And so I think we've, we've been, like, what I feel like is happening is IT is starting to percolate up out of the basement through the organization. And I found leadership very receptive. I mean, they still want their project plan and they still want their waterfall, but they're, they're very receptive to particularly early warnings and, and very understanding with that. And if you, if you keep the communication flowing, and that even goes for pesky designers. If you keep the, if you keep the communication flowing early and quickly, and and you know, and and are talking and and communicating, that it's it's less brittle. People don't feel upset about it. So, but yeah, you, it's the both. You need that pre-planning up front to get the funds, to so people have something to talk about. I was joking with somebody that I don't share that agile triangle very often, yeah. right? Where where all all I can guarantee is the money we're going to spend and the time it's going to take, you know. But we joke about it offline and one on one, you know. That and and the outcome is so positive that that people go along with it. So yeah, we're, we're getting better at the communication piece. It's just worse. We get to it too late, you know. Yeah, we yeah. we come across it when we're already. You know, a bunch of the way through our program increment, and they're like, oh well, we have to start over and go See, back I, now. I would say, yeah, that's on the scrum master and the project manager. Yeah. That's that's what they're supposed to be doing is is keeping yeah. an eye on that stuff and and not making any decisions. Just keep it current, yeah. keep it keep it flowing. Yeah, and that's a that's an area of definite improvement that we've targeted. Just getting that communication in front of more people, yeah. you know, to the point of you know it starts to be a little annoying. You know, if that's what it takes, then that's what we'll do. And I kind of try to take a little bit of that on my shoulders as a QA as well, and say, hey, you know, even during increment planning, I try to you know, it's it's a really pessimistic look, but I usually try to bring up like, hey, we have missed our target you know, time after time after time, and it doesn't look like we're actually changing anything. We need to be able to, you know, adjust so that way we don't, you know, we save our, our BAs and our product managers right. a little bit of egg when we promise something and then we don't deliver on it. Right. So right. we're getting better. It's a process for oh, sure. Yes, it takes process. it takes a but lot of effort and time. It's a new process. The integration of IT into the integration of IT into the business. And as a cornerstone of the business, we're catching up with that now. That's what Agile is, is catching up with the reality that the business is IT, yeah. <laughs> you know.